Hi everyone, and welcome to Bluebeam Review. My name is Ari, and I'm a Bluebeam Certified Instructor with Digital Drafting Systems. Today, we're going to learn about the markups list. We can access our markups list by clicking on this button right down here. It looks like three dots and three lines. Once we do this, the markups list should open, but if your markups list doesn't open like mine did, then you may want to look for an invisible line that's in between the markups list and the navigation bar. And when I mouse over it, my cursor changes and I see a blue line that appears horizontally. Now, this line may be all the way down here. So it may look like this. And so you can always mouse over this line just by mousing over right in between where the markup list should be and the navigation bar and the status bar, which is right here. So I can then click on this and it also expands the markups list. And I can drag this up or down like this. Now, the markups list works in a very interesting way. It actually will pick up on markups automatically placed in Bluebeam Review. So I can place a markup in this area right here. Let's just make a text box. So I'll look for my text box shortcut right here. And I'll just make a box with some data. And you can see that it's automatically placing that markup into the list. And you can see that there's information already being put into the markup because I've set my markups default settings to change. So basically our subject has been put in automatically and that stays with the default setting. And if I go to my tool chest, each of my markups can have their own subject. So if I use this text box, for example, and I'll create one right now with other data, you can see that its subject is just text box. So the subject for markups by default is set to whatever the kind of markup it is, and then you can customize it. So this markup here, we can open up our properties list, and we can see that I set it to an Excel example for another tutorial. And for this markup, I've never changed its subject, so its subject is text box. The subject is so important because you can use it to categorize your markups and organize them in the list. So right now I'm sorting by author in the list, but if I sort by subject, then you can see that all the subjects that contain the same markups are in the list. So if I click on a markup on my drawing, you'll see that it highlights itself in the list. And right now I only have one Excel example basically with a text box. And this markup here is actually part of the text box subject. And I have many text boxes. I have about 11 of them. So all 11 are now in this list sequentially according to their comments and other information and when they were created by their date. So all that information is being taken into account to organize these markups. Now let's make some more markups and see how they interact with the list. Let's create another markup for the markups list and let's modify some of its properties so that we can sort it properly. So I'm just gonna go to the tools dropdown, markup, and I'll just use a cloud plus tool. So I'll make the cloud and then the call out and I've already modified my default cloud plus tool to have a triangle around it. So I'm just gonna type the number four and then press the escape key. I've now quickly made a revision cloud. Now the subject line for this revision cloud is cloud plus. So I'm going to change that here in my properties panel. I could also double click here in the markups list and I can change it very quickly here. So I don't need my properties panel open. So I'm just going to call it structural. And now in order to solidify what I've typed, I can just click inside of an empty area here. And you'll see that the actual markup has moved its location. So let's click on it again and let's make sure there it is. The subject has now been input and now it's got its own little tab in the subject line and there's only one structural markup. There's no others so far on this drawing. So let's take this text box and let's also give it the structural subject. So this time I'm gonna do it in properties because I wanna show you guys what happens. Firstly, because I've already used the structural subject before, it pops up in autocomplete. Now, autocomplete can be managed in preferences, and I already have a tutorial on that, so you guys can check that out. If you ever type lowercase words or make any spelling errors accidentally, then you'll want to get rid of those so that when you type the letter S, you only get subjects that start with the letter S that are clean and ready to be used. So I'm just going to click on structural here. Now, when you click on an existing subject, it does solidify the input, but be careful because your cursor is still flashing here, and when you type text, from scratch, that doesn't mean that your input has actually been input into the program. So a few ways to do this is you can click into another box and now the input is solidified for sure. Now I still have the text selected, but the markups list did not navigate towards it. So I'm just gonna click in a blank area and then click on the markup again. This now allows me to navigate right to the markup and we can see that we now have two structural markups. 
so different kinds of markups can be categorized in our markups list. Now that we have a couple of these, let's look at how we can filter our markups properly. Let's use the filter button in the markups list in order to control our markups. So we do have our two markups. We have this one here and this one that are using the structural subject. Now let's sort by that. Now all we need to do is turn on this button right here. It's essentially a toggle for on and off. And I like to call this the master filter button. So we're just going to click it on. And now we have a new row that's above our columns, and we can now click on the word all above our columns and basically choose different kinds of information that's already present in our columns. So I'm going to scroll down, and I'm now going to click on structural. And basically, I can now see on my screen that all other markups are shaded out. Of course, you can see that signature fields and other form fields do not get affected by this. So the signature fields haven't changed, nor have these form fields up here. But all other markups are faded out except for the two markups that have the same subject. And the actual markups in the markups list have changed. We don't see any other markups. So using the filter button is a great way to make very specific summary reports. And we're going to get into summary reports near the end of this tutorial. So I've now sorted by structural, but I can go beyond that. I can actually sort more than one criteria in a column. For example, I can look at all structural engineering markups. So I'm going to click on engineer. And what this does is this actually includes more markups. So now we have one markup that was turned on. It happens to be this markup right here. As a result of this sorting, if I go to another column and I want to now go and filter more things, I can now click on this column. But you can see that there's only two authors here. One of them is me and the other one is M. Weber. And that's because both of us share whatever information is currently turned on. Because right now, if you look in the markups list, there's only three markups available, and I'm the author of the structural ones, while he's the author of the engineering one. So as a result, I can now sort by either or. So I'm going to click on his markup. And now my markups have disappeared. Even though structural is turned on, all three criteria must be met. Now, what happens is, is that certain criteria doesn't really always have to be met. So for example, this markup does not have anything to do with structural. However, it has engineer and M. Weber, so it does remain on. So all you need is a majority of criteria in order to be turned on in this filter list right here. So now let's just do a fit page by double clicking the middle mouse wheel. And let's now unsort what we've done. So we can click on the column again. And we're just going to clear all. This only clears it per column. So I'm going to go to this column as well. And I'm also going to clear all right here. All right, so now we are basically done filtering. However, you may have noticed that there's a button next to the filter list. And this is very similar to a settings button that we've seen in Studio Sessions. The Dynamic Fill also has this when you turn on the panel that appears up here. But this one is rotated 90 degrees to the left, oddly enough. So I can click on this. This is the Saved Filters button. It's not really for settings, but it actually allows us to choose between different kinds of filtering options. So I can turn this one on or off. And this one used to have markups associated with it, but I have changed those basically uh, a long time ago. I used to have a concrete exterior subject that I was using. And basically what I can do is I can click on this and I could either clear it. And basically we can't really modify these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this. So I'm going to delete this and I'm going to add a new one. It's going to ask me if I'm sure. I'm going to say yes, that's not a problem. And let's make another one. Now, in order to make one, basically, we basically have to start sorting our columns. So let's make one now. I'm now going to sort. Let's go once again by structural. We'll keep it very simple. And we're just going to do structural in this case, so we get these two markups. Now I have this ready, so I can now go to the button, and I can save whatever filters I have currently turned on. So I'm going to call this structural, structural filter. And now I can click on the check. And now I have this structural filter setting ready to go. So I can turn this off and on very quickly. So this is a bit faster than having to go to the column itself and finding whatever criteria you're looking for. You can just go to the Save Filters button and then turn it off or on whenever you need to. And so that's how Save Filters works, and you can create them whenever you need to. Now, before we finish, let's make sure that we turn off our master filter button. We don't have to, but when we do this, it saves us a bit of room in our markups list so we can see more information while we're working. We can also import and export our markups from one PDF to another. 
and we can do this by going to the markups list dropdown and then mousing over markups and we have export right here. Let's do that first. We're going to create a new file that contains all of our markups. It is called a .bax file. I'm going to put underscore markups at the end of the name so that we can easily identify it. And I'll save it right here in this folder. And now we're going to make a new document. Now this works best if your page is the same as your current page. So your page size right here is important. I'm going to test this with a regular 8.5 by 11 page and we're going to see what happens to the markups when we import them. So I'll just make a brand new PDF. 8.5 by 11 settings are fine. Now let's make it a bit bigger with one full page and zoom out a bit so that we can see exactly what happens. So we're going to go to the markups list dropdown, mouse over markups, and we'll click on import. We're going to locate our file. We can also locate any other PDF, so we can import other PDFs if we needed to. But here's our BAX file right here. So we're just going to click on that and click on open. Now look what it says here. This is very important. Some markups have not been imported because there aren't enough pages in this PDF. This means that the export, or the import, excuse me, uh, no, sorry, the export, also included all the other pages that were part of my other PDF. So I had six pages. So because there's only one page, the markups only import to one page. And as you can see, they do import in their exact same spots, but this page is not the correct page size. So the markups are kind of floating in this gray area right here. But this is essentially how the import-export works, and you can see how easy it is to bring lots of markups from one PDF to another. All you really need to do is match the page sizes and the amount of pages so that you get all your markups in the right locations. Now let's close out of this and let's create a PDF summary report. Not only can we create summary reports, but we can also create hyperlinked summary reports along with sending our data to Excel or database and spreadsheet programs. So we can do all of this by going to this button right here, the summary report button, and then we can look and see that we have CSV, XML, and the PDF summary options. CSV is for databases and is very simple. XML works with most spreadsheet programs and is a little bit more complex, but it shows the same data. It just shows it with alternating colors for the rows, and it has some drop downs so you can filter them with Excel or other spreadsheet programs. And in this instance, we're going to use the PDF summary because it works very well with Bluebeam Review itself. So we'll do PDF summary. And we can change all of our settings and then decide to go to export as and change our file type right here. So it doesn't really matter what file type you're going to be using. What matters is what deliverable you want. Now, the most important setting here is append and hyperlink to current PDF. This is an incredible setting that will allow us to essentially create a, the hyperlinked summary report, which is almost like a table of contents. And you can click on the icon for each markup and navigate to its location on the page. So we're going to create that today. Now, when we do this, the export to now grays itself out. The reason for this is because if you don't append and hyperlink, you're essentially creating a separate file, and this file is more so for visual purposes. But if you append and hyperlink to the current PDF, you're going to add your summary report to the existing PDF, so you'll have many more pages in your thumbnails list, and those pages will be hyperlinked to existing pages in your PDF where those markups are located. So we're going to do that. It's going to be a really, really cool feature that we'll show. Then we can change the name of those files. If we had a separate file, that would be useful. We could have this called uh, markup summary, but in this case, we don't really need to do that. Then we have templates here, which by default, there are no templates, but if you wanted to, you could have all of your settings predetermined and you can import them right here. Now there's another way to do this. There's configs right here. So you can save your configuration and load it here. And this applies to all the settings in your output, filtering and sorting, and your columns. So we're going to demonstrate that a little bit, but we're not going to make a configuration today. We're just going to change our settings and get that ready to go. Now, the style is also very important. This will determine how our markups are going to look on the report. If we use table, it's going to condense them into a table, but it usually doesn't show enough information per markup, and we're going to be showing a lot of information. So flow is going to work better for us because it's going to sequentially show our markups in their own section on the page. So we're going to leave it at flow, and you guys can experiment with table if you'd like to. Now let's move on to filter and sort. This allows us to choose which data is going to be shown in specific columns. We can turn certain columns on or off with the columns tab right here, but for now we can choose the data that goes inside of them. 
for example, it's not really useful to go to cost analysis floor area. And all I can really turn on or off are existing markups that have certain data on the page. So I don't really want to exclude any of these markups. I want all of them in this instance. But a column that could be useful to filter out would be the subject column. If I only want to look at concrete markups or only markups that are in the interior of my drawing, then I could choose those subjects only and I can start to filter certain things right here. We don't need to do that in this instance. We're just going to go to columns right here. Now, this is where I can turn off and on certain columns. I don't need the status column, so I'm going to turn that one off along with the color column. I don't need that one either. And we can leave the other ones on and we can see that many different columns are on. I'm also going to turn off a few columns down here. I don't really need these right now. There's some extra cost analysis columns and this should be good. Now, before we leave, you can see the save config and load config is right here once again. So you can now, once you're done setting all your settings for the output, filter and sort and columns area, then you can save your configuration. It'll be a special file, this .bcf file, and then you can load your configuration whenever you need those settings again. This also applies to the pages and the PDFs that you include when you're doing the summary report, because you don't have to do it for one PDF set. You can see at the top of my screen that I have just my PDF ready to go, but I can click on add right here and I can add files or a folder with many different kinds of files into my PDF summary report. Then I can go to pages up here and I can choose which pages are going to be part of the summary report. We're ready to go. So I'm now going to click OK and we're going to see how the report works. It's now going to process all of our markups. And because I'm appending and hyperlinking the report to this PDF set, we're going to see that it's just going to add new pages to thumbnails. It shouldn't take too long for about 100 markups. And it's finding them on all the pages in this instance, and that's fine. So once it's done processing, it now goes to the first page of the summary report. And we can go to our thumbnails list, and we can now scroll up. And here it is. So now we have a new page down here. It looks like it's labeled all the pages after the last one. So they're all labeled as six, which I find funny. Uh, a quick way to fix this, by the way, is you can go to your thumbnails drop down and you can reset all page labels. So that's quite useful. Let's actually do that now. We're going to say yes to that. And now I have ruined the first three pages in this PDF set, but I can easily fix them. I already have a tutorial on how to create page labels. The button happens to be right here. But for now, this is very good. So now all of our pages are labeled. So we have 34 pages. If we subtract six, we added 28 pages to this PDF set. That's how many markups there are. And look at this. So much data is being shown per markup. So that's why you may want to be careful. Certain columns and certain markups don't really need to have so much data in them. So you can turn off certain columns so that you can fit more markups per page. So this is the first page of our PDF summary report. And I know where most of these markups are. So I'm going to go to a random page and I'm going to demonstrate how cool this is. So I'll just go to page 18 right here. I don't really know where these offices are. So where is Office 225? Well, I could locate it manually or I can move my mouse over the image and you'll see that it changes to a little pointer cursor. This means that this is a hyperlink. So now I can click on this. It just took me back to page one. You can see page one is right here in the bottom. And here is Office 225. It didn't highlight it, but it did center it on my screen and zoom in a little bit for me. So this is exactly why these summary reports are very useful. And now I essentially have a table of contents. So we can demonstrate this one more time. I'm going to go to another random page. Let's go to this one right here. And let's see where Office 240 is. I don't quite remember. Actually, I think it is next to 225 in this instance. So <laughs> bad example. <laughs> Looks like 241 is right below it too. So let's actually do this one, this conference 211. Where is this markup? Ah, there it is. It's on page one. And now it's in the center of my screen. So I know exactly where it is in relation to the other markups. And so that's essentially how you can use a hyperlinked summary report to navigate around your PDF and locate certain markups. And this is really great when you have a deliverable and you want to manage all of your markups. And that's essentially how it works. Thanks very much for watching our tutorial on the markups list in Bluebeam Review 20. Once again, my name is Ari and I'm with Digital Drafting Systems. Hope you have a great rest of your day.